I'm mainly going to focus on some test uh, uh, case studies. I'm going to do an introduction just to make sure we're all on the same page when it comes to what defensive programming really is. But the main talk is going to be about the case studies themselves. So, okay, what is defensive programming? Um, when I get started to prepare for this uh, presentation, I had uh, my ideas about what the programming is, but when I went to the internet, I discovered that people have lots of different ideas what constitute defensive programming. To the point that they disagree with each other vehemently about whether or not certain practices are or are not defensive programming. For example, does input validation count as defensive programming? Some people say yes, some people say no. How about input sanitation? It's a bit more aggressive than just validating the input. You're actually going to change it to make sure it's valid. Still, some people don't accept that as defensive programming. Some people say it's overreaching defensive programming. How it relates to contracts. Some people say contracts are an alternative to defensive programming. Some people say contracts are a form of defensive programming. Slight difference there. And which of the following uh, practices are to be considered defensive programming? Asserting, logging, sanitation, exceptions. Different people have different opinions. So I did what I guess most of us do. I went to the approximate uh, source of all human knowledge, Wikipedia. And Wikipedia had this to say, I'm not going to actually read you all of this, you can read it yourself, but I did emphasize a few things that I thought were important. One, it describes the facing programming as design. And second of all, it says that it has runtime and maintenance cost, and it has unnoticed and incorrect results by practicing it, which is odd, because every programming method or idiom that you're going to use have upsides and downsides, but if you go to Wikipedia page about object-oriented programming, you won't see in the first paragraph all the things that can go wrong with object-oriented. Yet, in defensive programming, this is somehow was important enough to be on the first paragraph of defining defensive programming. So what's the problem? The problem is that usually what's happening is that you start to develop your project, you work very hard, lots of lines of code, and congratulations, you got to the point where the code works. You optimize it, you spend more time on it, and it's fast, it's clean, it's a great code. Assuming everything is correctly sanitized and all the inputs are fine. Okay, not a problem, you're just going to harden your code to make sure it can handle all the unusual things that might come up. And then you'll figure out, but I have to ask myself just two small questions. What can go wrong and how can I fix it? So you start to insert all sorts of really weird lines of code into your clean code to try to figure out where things can go wrong, how can I fix them, and it just keeps piling up and piling up and eventually your code that was so great and wonderful at the beginning is not so shiny and sparkling and you run out of time and you have to ship whatever you want because customers are waiting. So why did it went wrong in this scenario? Well, the first thing is that's not how design is supposed to work. First you design, then you code. You're not supposed to go, if defensive programming is part of design, you're not supposed to first complete all your code and then go back and design the defensive part of it. The second thing that went wrong is that you separated the functionality, what the code is supposed to do, from the security 
making sure the code is actually correct. Of course, in many respects, it's the same thing. If the code is not secure, if the code doesn't do what it's supposed to do, because the input is corrupted, your functionality will break. And you didn't have a clear policy going in of saying, what, I, what am I defending against? How am I defending against? And where am I defending against? Who is responsible to handling the errors that will occur in the program? So I want us to think about defensive programming on two levels, a strategical one and a tactical one. On the strategical level, we got to have a policy that says, in our program, this is how we're going to handle errors. I'm, are we going to validate the input and reject it if it's not valid? Are we going to correct inputs? Are we going to use contracts? Are there going to be white contracts that explain what the, pro what the program is supposed to do in every possible case? Or the narrow contracts that say just in a specific case, or just what they do in a specific cases, and if there's undefined behavior, all bets are off. On the tactical level, we have to design the API in a way that will help us design where and when error handling should happen. We should be very careful to maintain object consist consistency and all the rest of the really good usual uh, paradigms that you read about good programming in general. We should know that there are two kinds of defensive programming. If, I'm, if I have a library and a source code that uses the library, I can, as the library writer, defend uh, against me use of my library. If I expect pointers to be passed on to me that are not null, null pointers, I can check that and I can defend myself against the user misusing my library and calling my APIs with inputs that I did not anticipate. But there's the other side of it, which means I can protect the user who calls my library from calling me in a way that would be harmful to him. If I'm maintaining that uh, the consistency of my code and I make sure that I clearly notify the user when an error happens, it will be less likely that uh, I will be invoked in a way that will damage the rest of the code. And important things to notice, uh, and I bothered it, uh, people don't really check. If you invoke and you say, well, my uh, return code, I will use my return code, and uh, the user will check the return code and know whether or not the operation succeeded, uh, be sure that most of users will not do that and will ignore uh, that. I, I don't know how many people really check that uh, new doesn't throw an exception. <coughs> Uh, I certainly don't. I don't know how many people check that malloc didn't return null PTR. The people don't do that. They should. They don't. Um, but C++ does have a few things that will help us when we're writing our code to be more proactively defensive without uh, uh, damaging the code too much. The important thing are uh, public versus private. If I have a class, I know that the private methods are protected in the sense that only the public method can invoke them. And if I, put, and if I make sure in the public uh, function method that uh, the code is correct, that the input is valid, the uh, private uh, method can rely on that. Const is very important. Passing arguments by, uh, by reference instead of passing a, po a raw pointer is very important. It will save you a lot of problems. And uh, resource allocation is initialization. The amount of problems that I had in my C code that would have been avoided by that is staggering. Uh, there also, uh, I did a break because the rest of the uh, uh, indications are from C11, but uh, templates versus macros, templates are way more protected than macros. Uh, smart pointers, 
the indication that uh, the function won't draw an exception, and static assert is also a useful mechanism to make sure that the code is valid. Okay, so unless we have general questions, we can move on to the first uh, case study. If anybody has anything they want to say? Okay. So let's go on. So uh, I started working with a library called Serial. Uh, it's a C++ 11 library. It does serialization, it takes your object and it writes it out in JSON, XML, or binary format that you can save and load later on. Um, and it throws exceptions when an error occurs. So far, so good. What's the problem? Well, here's what's happening. I want to read from a JSON file some field that I'm looking for. Say a string uh, called uh, middle name of the user. But that field may or may not be present. Some people don't have a middle name and therefore the, the field will not be present in the JSON file. If the field that I'm trying to read doesn't exist, Civil reports it as an error and throws an exception. Fine. So far so good. But even if I didn't miss reading your middle name, I still want to continue and, and read your family name. But after throwing an exception, Civil is in an inconsistent state. And I can't do that. So, uh, here's a very simplified version of Civil code. What happens is that we have a, a start node uh, method that really looks in the JSON file for the section that I'm going to read. And uh, if the search doesn't find it, it was an exception, and it uh, then nullifies the field that uh, we are searching for, so we won't run into it the next time. What happens if I draw an exception? the value of its next name doesn't get changed back to null. And every time we get into starting to load the, uh, the value from serial, I will keep being stacked on the same value that I failed on. So if I started looking for, if its, ne its next name was set to middle name, we didn't find it, we threw an exception. <coughs> the next time we're still looking for its for middle name. We didn't move on. So obviously the fix is very simple. I should switch these two lines and first nullify its next name and only then throw an exception. All right, so that's a simple bug. Why am I bringing this up to you? Because that's a simplified code, but the list of functions that is actually involved is much larger than this. And in fact, the function that uh, throw an exception is the second one here. It's in the radio and it doesn't even have access to the variable of its next name. So it can, from that point, actually change the value. And all the other functions are involved in many flows of the code. So trying to change the behavior over there will have massive implications over how civil works. So the solution that I came up with is that whenever I catch the, uh, the exception, I have to manually nullify the uh, the value. Fortunately, it was the set next name was publicly exposed in Serial, even though it's not documented anywhere. And it's very error prone because every time I keep forgetting to nullify the field, and somewhere along the way, when I least expected, things behave as I don't expect them because I forgot to fix the problem. So what's the insights that I got from this scenario? One, and I looked for who uh, the quote was originally from, and I'm sorry I forgot, but uh, an answer prevention is worth a pound of cure. If this has been done in civil itself, I would have saved me literally hours of work of trying to figure out why things go wrong, and it would get my code way cleaner, way simpler, and way easier to understand. Another insight, beware of exceptions and consistency. It's very easy to say 
whenever I encounter a problem, I should draw an exception. But draw an exception usually means that I leave the uh, object in the middle of work when it's probably in inconsistent. It's in the middle of, that's what the exception is. In the middle of processing a function, I'm going out. Obviously, things are not stable. And uh, exceptions are not really a good replacement for error handling policy. The fact that CO did not have an error handling policy meant that there was no good place in their code to handle the, to handle the error clearly. And uh, the last insight, and unfortunately I only got that after I finished developing everything, is that had I decided to wrap serial and do the all catching the exception and nullifying the variable uh, in an object that wraps the, uh, the serial code, I didn't, wouldn't have to do it each and every time on my own. Would have saved me, again, a lot of time. But I only learned that, I only thought about it late in the game. You can learn from me and do better. Okay. Uh, any question about this, in this case? Or should we move to the next? You actually do not need to catch exception. There is so, a talk from Alexandrescu that talks about... Are you ready? Yes, we have a question here. No? Yeah. No, uh, we have a question. Uh, Peter. Yeah, yeah. I have another question. It seems like uh, <laughs> by having an optional field, either the library doesn't support that piece of or you're using exceptions for, for logic flow. That's the main problem. So you, you either need to replace the library or make a pull request or check the field exists before you search for it or something like that. But it seems like the library is inappropriate for usage type and trying to use exceptions for control flow is, is the problem. Um, you could argue that. That's not how the library uh, was designed. Again, you could say that they should have, uh, what, you're, what you're suggesting is really saying, there should have been a contract that says, you have to verify before calling me that the field exists. Civil, yeah. does, civil doesn't provide me with a way to do that. So I can't even check before calling. <laughs> so either way, you, you could say, uh, I should have, uh, they should have provided me a way to do that and it, then it would have been my problem or my responsibility to check before calling, but they didn't do that. So I don't have any option other than calling and catching the exception. And yes, we had a question here. Uh, there is a talk of Alexandrescu where it uh, talks about scope guard. Okay? And scope guard allows you to define actions which uh, happen automatically when you exit what always, it's, uh, we know uh, uh, with uh, log, automatic auto log, but also allows you to define actions that happen only on success or on failure, based on number of uh, unhandled exceptions when you enter and exit scope. Yes. So this is the possibility to, to check this uh, field and make it now, when you exit your scope with uh, prone exceptions. It should be inside the code of a library, not yeah. a... Okay, so let me just uh, repeat what you just said. Uh, there was a comment here that uh, scope guards can be used uh, in order to uh, help fix this problem, that you throw the exception in an internal uh, method, and the scope guard will correct the problem when, this, when the exception goes out of the uh, scope. Uh, correct, again, like you said, it should have been part of the library, it's, uh, part of the library code itself. And uh, I'm not, I'm not, again, I, I'm not trying to fix civil at this point, uh, but you're right, the, 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 it was possible for them to write the code in such a way that they would have thrown the exception and not keep the inconsistency, uh, the, 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 the object in an inconsistent state. But they still have to figure it out and figure about it in advance. And you still need to know where you want to put those scope guards that you talk about. Any other comments?
Okay. Uh, let's move to the uh, second case study. Uh, okay, so we're just trying to do the, the second case study fast and we we'll skip the third one. Uh, choose one of them. Choose one. I'll choose the second one because we already started. Uh, so uh, this is a very uh, simple case that we have here in the, in, in the checkpoint. Uh, we want to create a structure that represents a packet on the wire and we get a bunch of bytes and we want to create the structure that will allow us to interact with those bytes uh, in a smart way. <coughs> the problem is that uh, those bytes might be corrupted, maybe because the input was malicious, maybe because which shit happens on the wire. And uh, we need to create a way to handle it. So uh, the main problem is, of course, that constructors don't return values. They just create the object. Uh, so there are a couple of options, and I'm going to run over this rather quickly. Uh, the first option is when you construct the object, detect there is a problem, and instead of, create, um, instead of initializing the object, just set it to some value that says something wrong happened in the construction itself. Uh, generally speaking, don't do that. It's a very bad practice. Uh, people tend not to check if the, if the value was uh, created correctly. Uh, everybody will accept packet, will have to be suspicious of it. Maybe it was miscreated or misinitialized. Uh, and it's not clear who should fix or do something about packets that are invalid in such a way. Uh, there is another option, and that is uh, first create the packet and then initialize it with some other method. And the great uh, uh, thing about that is the initialization method can return a value and can indicate whether or not something went wrong. Uh, there are also downsides. You still have to handle the fact that there is a packet out there that is not initialized because nobody called the initialization method. And uh, there is an overhead in writing the code which you first have to de declare the object and then you have to call the initialization method. Um, and it's easy to ignore the return value of the initialization. Third option, and uh, that's, all, that's also a very good favorite, and that's have draw an exception from the constructor. Uh, the, it has a really big uh, upside, which is all the packets are always valid, always initialized. You don't have to worry when you get a packet whether or not it's been initialized. You can save yourself all, the, all those checks. Uh, the downside is that there's still no clear owner of who has to catch the exception on the other side. And people don't generally expect constructors to throw uh, exceptions. I certainly don't. And there are some delicate points when thrown from a, cons from a constructor because the lifetime of the object have not even begun yet, so you have to be careful when the, when the throwing happens to clean up all the code properly. It's possible, but uh, there is uh, some downsides. The uh, fourth option that we went with is use a factory method. Uh, it has two uh, main uh, upsides. Again, uh, like constructions, uh, all the packets are always valid, always initialized. And there is a clear owner because you have to uh, use the factory method to actively uh, uh, validate that no, uh, no error has have occurred. Uh, the downside is that that's not a standard approach to doing this. So people always get confused when they start working with this approach until they get used to it. So I'm just going to run very quickly uh, on, uh, on the code. So my actual constructor is private. Nobody can invoke it. Instead, I have to, uh, to call gen packet that uh, returns some sort of wrapper. The wrapper will contain either the packet if the input was valid or some error if the uh, input was malformed in some way. So when using it, I can uh, use, get a possible packet from gen packet if I get an input. And I, can, I need to check if the possible packet is OK. If not, it's my responsibility to do something about it. And I can unwrap it if it's, if it's fine. If, on the other hand, it's a packet that I'm generating, it's an output, it's an in, something internal that I want to output to the network, and I know the 
the bytes are, the data is correct, it's sanitized, I generated it myself, I can trust it, I can just go and unwrap it directly. So the second line, the second section, really tells me as a reviewer that whoever uh, wrote those, this line is certain and is absolutely convinced that this cannot fail, this is fine. Right? Uh, so, uh, again, the, the main insight is API that clearly defines and declares when an error happens and who's responsible to handle the, the, uh, the error will make the code easier to maintain. Uh, and uh, always prefer to keep your, code, your object initialized and consistent to save any troubles that you may have. This is the certificate service, we're not going to get into that. Uh, any <coughs> questions quickly before we start? Yes. Right. So uh, I think you can add, uh, if you have a simple flow, you can add uh, a different approach. You can re return or create some dummy object on which actions have, like if you run it and put it in your pipeline or flow, it doesn't have any effect and then it just like, right, you had a bad packet, it does, none of the functions actually do anything on it. Yes, uh, uh, so uh, the suggestion was to make a, a dummy object. It's... Uh, so it depends on the complexity of your code. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a little close to the first approach in which uh, the, the packet you generate is a, is a, is a dummy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you are correct that you can make the dummy uh, <laughs> more consistent and not uh, misbehave if somebody tries to actually work with it. That will help. Uh, still, uh, you will run into questions like, okay, I want to print it out for debugging. What am I going to print on the dummy object? Uh, things like that. You can do that. Um, like I said, uh, it's an approach. Generally, I would like to discourage you from using it. Uh, from my experience, uh, you end up having to check in many cases in the code whether or not you're do dealing with the dummy or with an actual uh, fully initialized object. Anything else? Yeah, I just have a comment. Yeah. Uh, but by the way, the packet wrapper that you wrote is uh, there's something called this to be expected, which does exactly that with the generic class, which is like coming between a, a, a variant and an optional, which is, uh, I'm not sure we'll actually go and see the but you can find the open source implementation and give you exactly what you did for the custom wrap. <coughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I, I deliberately kept it uh, as a title of a wrapper because I did not want to go into details into that, but you are correct, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, the last solution sounds for me like the first one. You still have to check the error code. So what's the difference? That you declare the API that you have to check it? So the question was what the difference between uh, the, uh, the first and the second... Uh, the last the, one. The, 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 the first Eventually and the you have to check it manually anyway. In, right? in, so if you okay. forget here, you forget there. Okay, so uh, what's the difference? The difference is, uh, first of all, the fact that there is... Uh, an unwrap function, which means uh, that it reminds you you can't uh, use a packet and initialize it and pass it on. You have to write actual code to get the packet. So it's like throw exception, you must catch it, no? Kind of. Yeah, it's a little bit like, like throw, an ex like throw like exception and catch it. it. You, okay. you must do it. But uh, if you try to sit down and write the code and try to see how easy it is to forget, each and every one of those options, it's very hard to forget this one. Because you have to, you have to proactively write something to remind you that, you that you need to unwrap it. While in the first one, you have to proactively check for it. So it's easier to forget the first one, it's very hard to forget it here. Yeah, so now because this one, where now is the action? like exception that you must do something. Yeah, but here you, because you have to actively write the, the unwrap, you have it will remind you. So, you so, can't so, so, it. so let, so let me it just say, uh, uh, say uh, let me do, yeah, I'll like compile without it. Let me just uh, let me put it like this: you could theoretically write your code without exception, and it will work. There's no way that you can write your code without unwrap, and it will work. 
So you have, on the, on the first try, just to get the things going, you already have to, get, to address the security. The, 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 the option that there is a possibility of an error. While in the uh, throw and the catch, you can conceivably start without trying and catching the exception, and then go back and add it later on. Which is exactly the sort of thing that I'm arguing you shouldn't do because you should, when writing the code, when writing the functionality, you should already address the issues of how and how do you handle an error, and not and not decide later on do I try do I do a try and catch uh, when I de where I define the object or when in some other function around the who's responsible to do the try catch block whoever defines the object the somebody who uses. No, there's a stack, there's a call stack. Anybody on the stack call uh, should is conceivably be able to do the try-catch. Who among them is responsible to do that? That's how to decide. In this case, it's very clear who is responsible, whoever does the end-wrap. Uh, yes? What uh, can prevent uh, uh, a lazy uh, coder from writing packet, get 10 packet, dot, Unwrap and forget it. Uh, and, 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 and be happy all the, all the time until something bad happens to the tech. Okay, so what can uh, prevent uh, a lazy programmer from going for the second option directly and skipping the, uh, uh, the first one? The answer is nothing, but uh, in practice we see that that happens not so much. Uh, maybe you can have the in the assignment of the rate. Okay, so uh, I need to uh, stop uh, right now and move back to Jerusalem, but I'm still available here for questioning if anybody has it. Uh,